really useful for uh, making our ideas look really good. Uh, the physics side impresses me with this capability to take all the inertia, inertia uh, momentum, spring force, whatever kind of forces you want to apply, and solve this very ambiguous problem. Like SolidWorks engineers didn't know what kind of thing you were going to design. They can't make assumptions regarding the geometry of what you make uh, without knowing what it is you've even modeled. So they have a very general purpose physics solver built into SolidWorks. They also have a general purpose ray tracing uh, renderer that's an add-in, but you can use this free in the student version. And uh, that C7 rendering right there was done in SolidWorks last night. So that's, uh, it's stupid capable and makes some really nice stuff. Um, so just to go over your homework, I'm going to show you three things that you need to do for homework, but then I'll show you a fourth that I just kind of did to really show you what Sol basically, in my opinion, the most sophisticated thing SolidWorks can do. Uh, it takes too long to process to be assigned as a homework, really, so I left it off. Uh, the moon lander motion simulation is what's down here on the bottom right. It's not rendered, it's not super fancy, but you can see it has this little egg guy. Let me see if I can open up in SolidWorks. I had it here a second ago. Yeah, this one. So you got a little Egbert thing there, and uh, it's got three little landing legs. It has uh, simulated springs on each one of these struts, so it's kind of a two-bar leakage, uh, two-dimensional version with a four-bar. Uh, <coughs> this could just easily be a real like, space-looking lander thing. This could be an egg. It doesn't really matter. I just applied mass to something, so you can try to use the land softly. Uh, it has lunar gravity applied to it. And what you're going to do in the first step is modify the suspension of the lander so that way, whenever we do a physics simulation of it, the uh, egg doesn't hit the ground and break. Uh, same thing as you'd use in a real moon lander, a Mars lander, whatever you're working on. You don't want your uh, sensors or payload or people or whatever to get killed on the way down. Since fortunately, you lose one of those sensors. Um, create a plot of the acceleration of the egg. That's one thing that's really nice. You can watch the animation go in a 3D window at the same time as you have a cursor go across the animation screen. So you can see exactly what's creating the peaks in force, what's creating the peaks in acceleration. Uh, slamming into the ground is a distinct peak in acceleration. So uh, that's what happens there. You finish the Marvel game motion study. This is one where I give you a little bit of creativity and uh, open, the, open the door a little bit more for you to make a 3D, 3D model to solve in a physics simulation. It's really just a, um, just have that one up as well. Marvel game assembly starts without this little connected plastic tube thing. This is just the uh, simplest one I could make. Uh, just real quick, right up here to solve the problem. You start with this ramp. There is a marble that begins at the top, right on this little ramp. You can't change this part, and you have to leave that ring where it's at. Then, basically, using some sort of connector device, rails, you make it as complicated or as uncomplicated as you want, shoot the uh, marble through that hoop at the bottom. Now, I'll show you how to do motion tracking. So, there's a point in the middle of that sphere, so you, it'll show you everywhere that ball goes. So, that way, whenever you turn it in, I have to just turn in a picture showing the motion track of that ball. And that lets the TAs know that you actually, in fact, succeeded in getting it through the hoop. <laughs> so you make that as simple. In this case, just a uh, pipe that puts it right through, or as complicated as you, as you want. Jumps, flips, you know, depends on how much time you have. Um, or how much do you think it is. <coughs> uh, number three, use PhotoView 360 add-in. This is the rendering plugin that is usable in SolidWorks. Create a rendered view of the C7 Corvette model. I didn't make that as some guy named Kubele, which I think he's German because all the uh, camera entries on his model are spelled K A M E R A. So, Germans. You know. uh, I'd recommend, I'll go over the details of how to use that and why uh, you do the things you do. But anyway, so it's also got number four down here is what, telling you exactly what you should turn in to get full credit. So, to start off with, we're just going to go straight into the Corvette rendering side of things. Uh, don't need those, don't need those. There we go. That looks great, right? You could turn, you could easily, just as easily turn that model in. It's put on the front page of a proposal. You spend the same amount of time making this as you would this. One, one of those pictures will win your proposal. One of those just kind of gets a yawn. Uh, and the only difference between the two is just the final few clicks for rendering things. So, like uh, most other things we're going over in this class, this is functions with an add-in called Photo View 360. That's again under Tools Add-ins, the same place that. Uh, simulation was that we went to last week. It's called Photo View. Uh, who knows what ray tracing is? Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, normal type of rendering just says, okay, there's a gray surface right here. This, there's a polygon that's gray there. So whenever I project on the computer screen, I just need to figure out mathematically its 3D orientation and turn those pixels on the screen gray. It's uh, called rasterizing. 
It's just a, it's simple, it's computationally efficient. This is how computer computer games are done. This is how your Xbox works. It's, it's ra raster graphics. It just projects polygons right onto the screen after it figures out their 3D uh, <laughs> size or whatnot. Ray tracing works differently. It knows the presence. It does all the 3D calculations. It knows where the surfaces are at, what color they are, but it judges them based on reflectivity, uh, spectrum reflectivity, diffusivity, meaning how much they spread out light when it bounces off. They can judge them based on index of refraction. Like if you go through glass, or if you go through water, or if you go through diamond, or if you go through whatever, different materials have different indices of refraction. So basically what it does is for every pixel on your screen, or sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on how accurate you do it, it sends out a beam of light. And it does this, to say it's for every pixel on your screen, it's one, it's not entirely accurate. It sends out a bunch of beams of light into the scene and simulates how light really works in the real world with a discrete number of paths. So it sends out these little virtual photons that bounce off the car, that go through the glass, that uh, are coming from the scene outside of this vehicle, and then figures out which one of those hit your, hit your monitor and kind of back calculates how it should look. It's extremely, extremely computationally intensive, but it's been a heavy uh, area of research in the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, ray tracing eventually will take over 3D rendering. Um, your PS3, PS4, Xbox One, Xbox 360, whatever, is still raster, but I can almost guarantee you before you die that 3D graphics will pretty much go straight to ray tracing. That means when you look through fog, it'll look like real life fog. When you look through a diamond, it'll be refracted properly. You can look at fish underwater. Instead of having to fake that refraction right now in your Xbox, they can actually just model the properties of water. Uh, they'll trace photons, you know, not billionth of them, but they'll trace thousands of photons through the scene to figure out what it looks like to you. So enough preachy preachy. Uh, time to go to make something cool. So once you turn on PhotoView 360, you get that menu up at the top. Uh, click on that, and you have several options. Uh, the first one you should look at are either integrated preview or uh, preview window. I'm going to click on preview window, and the only difference between it is integrated preview turns your entire 3D screen here into a ray traced window, a tra ray tracing view. Um, what the heck, I'll turn it on. Keep in mind, when you turn this on, SolidWorks gets pretty slow. So... It's not a cheap thing. Hopefully it's going to work. I tested the window. I didn't test any great preview. There we go. It's coming. So I think what's really neat is that it starts kind of pixelated, like whenever you move things. Come on, move. Update. This computer is totally throwing chunks. There we go. Okay, so finally a bit. You can see this taxing things quite a bit. Uh, it's not a cheap operation. I very seldom do it in 3D, but I think it's really kind of neat because you can see it starts with big fat pixels. Once it sits still, it'll sequentially improve the image until it finally gets something up to the full resolution of your screen. Okay, so finally this is working <coughs> up to speed. I don't know what it has to load. I don't know why it doesn't work right off the bat, but that's what happens. I think it's just really kind of sick looking that it even works like that. You can see it's actually bouncing light off the scene outside. We have lights that exist in the environment. It's actually bouncing off the, uh, what's the name of that? Footboard, rubber rail, I don't know. Ground mm -hmm. effects, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you change the scene, like let's change it to um, a rooftop. You should be able to see the sky reflected once it loads the scene. Changing scenes in uh, photo view takes a little bit of time. Come on. There we go. So you can see that the entire light changes, the color of light hitting the car changes. You can adjust all that, but you can actually see there's a photo being reflected in the glass. In fact, he built the car sideways. He actually <laughs> accidentally modeled it on its side. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. So you can see how kind of the, uh, the shadow is on the wall on the side right now. We can change which uh, plane is the ground. And that's why this city appears like, you know, the reflection is. The sky is that way. Um, I mean, that's what happened. So let's go ahead and start going into adjusting what's called the floor. That dictates which way is up and where the ground is at. Uh, let me turn off integrated preview and show you a more efficient way to get this thing done. Let the computer catch back up to itself. Okay, we're back to raster graphics, and it looks kind of terrible now that you've seen the volume. Um, we'll just turn on a preview window. 
This lets you, it does the same thing, just an external view. But the thing that I like about it is it's smaller, it's easier for the computer to crunch. It's a smaller graphic, it's not as computationally intensive. So as you're trying to get the graphics looking right, you're trying to judge reflections, color, all the rest of the stuff you're trying to balance to make uh, your render look nice, just keep this preview window small and it'll really help the computer stay caught up. Of course, I'm going to say that solver for this hard crash. You know, whatever. Let's see. It should catch back up. Oh, oh, there we go. All right. Good. See how it updates quite a bit quicker since it's a small window? Uh, this is one place where you'd really be nice to have uh, two screens, but we don't. Okay. Uh, editing the scene. First of all, I'm going to go back to the white, uh, plain white, because I think it looks better than that blue. You can see why you do this last. This is not something you want to leave on when you're trying to do actual 3D modeling. It would, it would make you pull your hair out. Okay, so PhotoView 360. You can go to Edit Scene. This has some very basic things, like you can change the color of the background. Right now it's white. You make that orange, you make that line green. If you want to take this and put it in a picture uh, in PowerPoint and be able to click on the background and make it all go away because it's a solid color, you can do that. You can uh, simply just make all the green go away. If you wanted to um, change the environment going around it, you can do that as well. Uh, advanced features, you can do fixed aspect ratio. Uh, auto size of the floor. This is where we start dealing with where the floor is at. Uh, you can deal with rotations. A line floor with uh, bottom view plane, you can select different things. X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z, uh, the selected plane. Uh, we'll just go ahead and align the floor with, we probably need to do selected plane. The correct one would be, looks like front. Perfect. Uh, we'll just put that. Okay, so now the floor is in the right orientation. You can see here in the render that the shadow is in fact now underneath the car, which is where it should be. All right, so floor offsets zero millimeters. If you have something that needs to be floating, you can make something look like it's hovering. You have a flying Camaro, you have a flying airplane. You can do that. You can also just turn the floor completely off uh, if you don't want shadows underneath your vehicle. Because the same way that I stressed uh, getting a plain white background, if you have a shadow right next to your picture, it's not going to disappear collectively once you get it into uh, PowerPoint either. So anyway, illumination is also another big deal. Uh, background brightness dictates how white the background is or how bright it is. See, that makes the that's probably the easiest way to make the shadow go completely away, or mostly away. Uh, rendering brightness uh, is basically how bright do the surfaces appear. You can make the car appear more white if you really crank that up. Put more white, put more light onto it, or if you turn it down, you start getting a very dark, dark car. So you see kind of the extreme. Uh, scene reflectivity. Let me zoom this in a bit. See what's going on. It's basically how reflective the entire car is. You can do this as a global setting. So that way you don't have to go into every material or every surface and change how reflective it is. You can just change it globally in a scene. Uh, reflections are good. Shiny things are better. So make that very drab and dull where it looks basically just like raster rendering. Where you can really take advantage of uh, reflections. Alright, so that's how you do pretty much edit scene. If you want to, um, let's say you wanted to match in one situation, I had a picture where I rendered an aircraft uh, flying into the sunset. And so most, it was, it was really awesome, but if you have a, oh great, the car's back on its side. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Um, if you fly into the sunset, you're not flying towards white light. If I did a rendering, all the lights by default are colored white. But whenever the sun is setting, it's certainly not sending white light at your object. It's sending what, red, orange, whatever the atmosphere is refracting. Uh, you're getting some very colored light coming in. So if I would have rendered the airplane white and put it into a reddish sunset picture, photoshopped it in, it would look really, really dumb. Uh, obviously photoshopped, it wouldn't look like it fit in. So that's the kind of the second tier. If you can render something, that's cool. If you can render something and match the color of light, that's really good. That's when you start to get into like movie level type stuff. Uh, you know, you're not going to go work for Pixar, but it's going to be great. Um, that's where it really looks like it fits into the scene. So we can match the color of the background. The way you do that, go to View, Lights and Cameras. Uh, this is where you can turn on and off perspective as well. We had that, oh, it's gone. Uh, come back. We had uh, perspective turned on for turned on at the moment. Car looking 
pull again. There we go. We go to view, lights and cameras. You can add directional lights, point lights, spotlights. I kind of leave that to you to play with. You can figure out the difference between the two. You can add a different camera view if you wanted. But the thing you really want to do here is go to properties and you change the light. Ambient is only what happens in raster graphics. It's only inside of SOLIDWORKS. But these others, like camera one, which was with a K because uh, the guy's German that made this first of all, so it's okay. Uh, if you want to change yeah. the camera view, click on that and you go to these camera properties. You can change the field of view. If you have, want to have a very wide angle lens, it takes up to like 80 degrees. All of a sudden it makes it feel like you're farther away, but really all that's happened is you've expanded your field of view so that car takes up a smaller portion of it. All you have to do is accept the camera. You should be able to zoom back in. Come on. I think one of those like awesome, you know, right out the bumper shots where the you know the cars that come around the corner, they get those really cool pictures. You can play with that. So really um, anything over about 65 degrees from the view starts to look kind of weird. Does anybody know approximately what the human eye sees, field of view wise? Like if you start bringing your hands in from the side, at what point do you see them? I can see, if I look straight forward, I kind of see them right here. So that's pretty far, but really it's only about 57 degrees. So if you want to match like what a human would see, about 57-ish, depending. Okay, did you have a question? Or? But no. Oh. He was testing his eyes. <laughs> he was testing what? Oh, he's testing his eyes. <laughs> it's kind of it's interesting, right? But anyway, uh, so that's something to think about. Oh, that entire wheel is just like gone. That, that's good. But it works there. Uh, let's take this back down to human levels. Mm -hmm. About 60, 59. See, it looks almost about normal. Except we'd be taller than that, so we'll be from about there. That's how you adjust the camera. You can uh, change the aspect ratio of the picture, so on and so forth. Uh, that's your kind of view settings if you're willing to mess with it. Uh, to do the same thing with lights, lights and camera, you can go in here to properties. Uh, we'll mess with the directional. Uh, you see you have a, both a basic tab, this is the raster lighting, and a photo view. Uh, right now that light was not turned on in photo view, so we can turn it on, you can see everything gets a little shinier. Uh, but if we go back to basic, this is where you change the uh, position. You have to go zoom out the model again. You see this little light can thing showing up? That's showing you the position of the light in 3D. If I change longitude or latitude, that'll move it around. So let's see if we can get a nice reflection off that corner of the car. Zoom back in, and now I've set up lights in a way that really highlights that uh, body panel line on the right side. Setting up proper lighting, you've, seen, you've all probably known that photographer guy who will sit there for like two and a half hours and light the scene. Uh, photographers go very deep into that. The guys who take, you know, like the brochure pictures of these Corvettes and everything, that's basically why they get the job. They're very, very good at lighting. Um, so if you're really going for a great shot, spend some time, make it look nice, move the lights around to show the best features of your model. You can move lights around to hide problems in your model. Just make sure there's a shadow on that spot. Uh, oops, mess this part up, forget it. You can also go in and retouch if you want to. You know, it's, it doesn't only apply to like models and stuff. You can retouch SOLIDWORKS parts of them, parts of the model. Okay, but that's basically that. So lights, uh, camera, uh, yeah, I, I was gonna go there, but it seemed kind of cheesy <laughs> to say actions. <laughs> Thank you for doing that for me. But uh, lights and camera, and that's how you can do rendering. And obviously, with these two pictures directly opposed to one another, it's no contest. I mean, you can show me pictures like this of your bridge on the internal pages if you just need to make something quick, if you want to do quick screen grabs. But it looks way too good to have something rendered. Uh, to have self-shadowing, like if you have pillars on your bridge to see the shadow <coughs> after the pillar going across the walkway in some other place, it's awesome. They set up a sun out as a light. Like you can just set a very far away directional light or, or omnidirectional light, wherever you want. Uh, I think it's awesome. I think anytime you do a proposal, anytime you do some sort of submission where you're asking people for hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of, of money, or points in this case, uh, do at least one rendering because they're cool. Okay, that's enough rendering. I think in your homework I said uh, turn in either a rendered view of the C7 Corvette or another cool model. GrabCAD.com has several cool things. If you like the Audi R8 better than the C7, feel free. Go find something that you like. This should be fun. This should be cool. Uh, turn in something good. Um, all right. So, physics simulation. We will go with the lander first to show you really what's kind of going on. Um, 
whenever you open this up, let me just, uh, yeah, let me close this out. I'm going to open it just as you would have opened it from the internet. All right, so the first download, it comes in like such, and has a problem. It's interesting because I fought with this last year. People were saying like, oh, there's a problem. It's not working. So I'm going to fix the problem, and it didn't work. This is actually the correct state of the model. For whatever reason, SOLIDWORKS thinks things is over. SOLIDWORKS believes that it's over constrained. Uh, it's not. If I delete these constraints, it doesn't work. The one that is missing when you download it, it probably won't give you an error, first of all. But the uh, coincident constraint between this shaft and that one, on this part of the suspension, just that one, doesn't exist. So whenever you first simulate the model, if you see this leg like flipping around all over the place and just doing stupid things, <laughs> check to make sure that that exists. Uh, I can add this. In fact, I did. I did mess this two, three times yesterday to try to make it where you can download it. It immediately works, but for whatever reason, it, uh, it's bugging out on me. I was fixed yesterday on my computer, but it doesn't work here. So it, the simulation works. Just if it freaks out, make sure that these holes are mated up together properly. That will fix it. All right. So this is all through an add-in called motion analysis or SOLIDWORKS motion. I've already added that in, so you have to sit there and wait for the software to load. Yes, I know. Okay, so this window will come up. I'll close any errors, but uh, it says due to model changes, the blah 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 components or features cannot be set to the previously specified location values at the start of the animation. You can have parts move to a different place at the beginning of the animation scene than they are in the assembly. Uh, that being said, note that you only do animations in assemblies. You can't animate parts themselves. You have to have like a mechanism. You have to have motion possible in the assembly. You have to have degrees of freedom to be able to animate things. Uh, do I want them, would you like to update the effective keys? Keys being the locations. Uh, no, I don't want to update it. Leave it how it is. Close things. And then just to show you what's going on, I'm not entirely certain this isn't going to mess up. If it does, I'll go fix that constraint. But we just go make, switch this to motion analysis. Animation and basic motion are built into SOLIDWORKS by default. Motion analysis is an add-on package which not only lets you animate, not only lets you create videos, it will actually tell you accelerations, plot paths, uh, do all sorts of the physics calculations that you uh, are missing in the other, other things. So motion analysis, and you just click this button here to calculate. Calculate the path to that lander. So you can see as it goes down, it detects the collision, everything compresses accordingly, and the suspension compresses, bounces, and then the little lander thing kind of hops across the platform. How many people have taken dynamics? Okay, so a couple. When you get in dynamics, or when you're in physics one, and they have you calculate that problem where the marbles at the top of the hill <coughs> rolls down, how fast it's going when it gets to the bottom, well, that, that's two or three lines of math. Whenever you're in dynamics, they have you calculate a garage door on its rails, how fast it will be going when it hit the ground if the spring broke. You know, that, that's like maybe a page of math. In systems of equations, you get into like two, three degree of freedom problems that you solve by hand. That's, you know, sometimes two, three pages of math. This type of stuff to do by hand would be, would be impossible. But it's just not impossible. Everything is possible. But it is improbable that you would like to do that on your own. But it's just flat built in. It's just a great simulation that lets you simulate the physics of things. If you want to see how things bounce off one another, if you want to throw two by fours at your storm shelter to see what the force is, you can certainly do that. Um, that being said, let's generate some data off of this simulation. Uh, first of all, notice I've done several things for you. The springs that exist on these little struts, obviously there's no physical spring on it. It's a virtual spring. I've added in three linear springs. One, two, three. When I click on them, they get a little virtual representation there. <coughs> what you can do is go in and edit them. Uh, let me go click on linear spring one. An edit feature it is a linear spring, the spring coefficient, K, of two pounds force per inch. That means for every inch that you compress the spring, it pushes back with two pounds. You can press it two inches, you get four pounds of force. Three inches, six pounds, so on and so forth. That's what linear means. Uh, free length is one inch. Uh, that's kind of where it likes to be. If you had no pressure on it, it's going to be one inch long. Uh, damping. You guys remember me talking about damping? Who remembers what it is? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, damping force would be like if, uh, if you were to have a sine wave that instead, instead of you know having the same amplitude all the way throughout it, the amplitude decreases yeah. with that. That, that is a mathematical yeah. definition of damping. But, yes? It slows down the pushback when the spring bounces back up. 
Correct. The, the, both of you are correct. The simplest way to say it is that it is a force dependent on velocity. The force dependent on velocity that usually opposes the direction you're going. Drag, like aerodynamic drag, is a damping force. It's a nonlinear one because it, deal, it scales with velocity squared. But uh, friction, for example, is a damping force. It always opposes your direction of motion. It slows you down only when you're moving. You have no friction if you're stationary. Uh, same thing like dampers in a car, dampers in anything. If you have some sort of oscillating motion, like you said, a sine wave, damping slows it down. And the force is proportional to how fast you're going. You know, so you can adjust the damping coefficient. You make this huge, uh, uh, an infinite damper. If, if you uh, put infinite damping on this shock, what does it do when it lands? That would be a spring without with zero damp. There'd be no loss of energy. If you infinitely lost all your energy right when you hit the ground because the damper took it all away, it doesn't bounce. It's just solid. It goes boom. Just stops. Uh, doesn't bounce. It doesn't do anything. It just slams into the ground. You get a massive spike acceleration, and uh, you probably kill everybody. So that's not good. Anyway, this is where you go to adjust the springs. Uh, they're simulated between the two axes. You really kind of see where that's set up. You have to add in gravity to some of these motion simulations. Uh, one of the examples in SolidWorks is a, uh, a cam follower, you know, like a cam in an engine, you have the arm, following arm and a spring. In that simulation, I don't believe they even turn on gravity. Why, why would you ignore gravity in a situation like that? It's negligible. Yeah, right, it's negligible. The spring force is gigantic. Uh, the frequencies are happening very fast. The other forces involved are huge. And plus, the rocker arm is sitting kind of in the middle, so even if you turn gravity on, that force is going to be extremely, extremely tiny. It's not going to really affect the dynamics of that system. So they, they figure out it's basically not that important. So you don't really have to calculate it. There's some situations where gravity just doesn't work. Uh, or is it important? It always works. Uh, solid body contact. This is another entry I had to make. If you zoom out, you'll see exactly what's going on here. Uh, solid works, if you don't turn on solid body contact in a simulation, Parts will fly right through each other. They don't know each other exists. They don't check the mesh to see if, oh, I just hit something. It doesn't even know. Um, so I have two regions here. The blue is one set, uh, and pink is another. The feet, all the legs, and the main egg body are checking for collisions with anything that is pink. All that pink is just one big part, we call it the moon part. Um, so this is checking every iteration, every time step to see if these two are touching each other. And if they are, it keeps them from interfering. It keeps the legs from going into the ground. Um, so that's what's let it lets it detect the collision. Collision detection is another big problem. Remember that MATLAB program I had you do? Uh, had you use for homework? MATLAB also does a lot of like simulation problems like this, usually in 1D, 2D. Uh, if you get to do something in 3D like this, it would be really complicated. Uh, maybe not if somebody's way more skilled than I am in MATLAB, but. In any case, it will do collision detection. Like if you're throwing a ball or bouncing a ball on the floor, to find out the exact instant in time where that ball hits the floor and bounces back is kind of hard. Because normally you just time step and you might skip over it. Uh, it takes some effort. Anyway, if we go on down in the uh, animation here, we see that all this is pretty just standard. That's, that's everything we have. Okay, so that's how you set up an animation. We have springs, gravity, and contact. Uh, if you don't have springs in your system, no need for that. You don't have to have those. You don't have to have really any of that except, <laughs> except for contact. Let's uh, make this useful to us now. Let's make a plot. Uh, this is the button right there. It said X and Y. So let's just select the category. I want to know the acceleration of the egg. So I'll go to that category. It has acceleration listed. I want to know uh, linear acceleration. Uh, what's the difference between linear and torsional acceleration? Or what do they call it? Angular acceleration here? Angular is spinning, right? Linear is just like in a direction. Then you just simply go down here. Well, on result component, you say x, y, or z components, but I just want to know the absolute acceleration. I want to always know the, max, the maximum magnitude of acceleration. I want to know it for the egg. Go to plot results, create a new plot, put in the existing, plot it versus time, or plot it versus frame, or whatever else you want. I'll just say, all right, cool. Generates this plot for me. No, I don't want to update it. Resize this to what I want, <laughs> and uh, if you had to guess, what creates the gigantic spike right there? Right, it's about 0.7 seconds. Contact to the ground. It just hit the ground. Yep, it sure did. So if we play back the the animation, which right now is at a playback speed of tenth, uh, a tenth speed, so you kind of come down. You see this red line go across. So soon we should see the egg come into frame. There it is. The initial bumps are the contact, and then boom, smacks the ground. 
So this, this uh, acceleration plot is probably the easiest way to check to see if you actually hit. If you see the spike, you know you hit the ground. Uh, so your homework is to modify the suspension of this little guy so that he doesn't die. You gotta protect your, uh, your egg kernel. So, egg be kind of fun. The trace lines here I have, uh, it creates these black lines automatically. That's something I just left in the file. That is something you have to turn on. It doesn't do that by default. Any point in your uh, assembly, you can track through time. Uh, in fact, I'll show you how to establish that here in the next example. The other thing you're doing with physics simulation is this marble example. Like I said, this tube is something I've put on for you. Whenever you start, you get two parts. You get the marble game starting point, which has everything except for the tube attached, and then the marble itself. But you notice I put a little point in the middle of the marble. I established gravity, and it's all body contact. Let me go ahead and delete these, set them up right in front of you so you know what's going on. All right, so this is how it should appear when you first come in here. I always like to right click on camera views and say Dis disable playback of view keys. Uh, animation by default keeps track of where you're looking as the animation happens and will play that back. So if you want to make a nice movie where like, say your part is coming together or you're driving down a road, you can kind of control where the camera is over time by creating different view keys. Uh, if you've ever messed with video editing or flash, <coughs> this operates a very similar way. Each one of these little diamonds on the timeline is a different, what they call, key. It, it's a point where something is remembered. Uh, let's go ahead and create gravity. So, kind of funny, it's a little pot. You know, like, they fall and they break. Uh, gravity is the easiest thing to set up. The dimensions are usually right, although those are very strange units. Uh, this green arrow dictates which way gravity is going to act. So, we want it to act down in the y direction. You can always flip it this way if you want it. Uh, just say okay. Again, keep in mind that gravity, gravitational force is really just a body force. If you want to simulate a railgun, you could simulate that magnetic field acceleration by applying a gravity in some direction. You can do it that way. All right, so gravity's acting down. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sim this now, right? Crap. Uh, so you see exactly what happened, right? It just fell straight through. That's not right. Why, why does it fall straight through? What do I need to do? Body, body contact, all right, so contacts. So this is uh, solid body contact. Uh, so I just want to maintain contact between that guy and him. Say all right. And recalculate this. This one takes a bit. The more complicated shapes you have, the longer it will take. Also, if you have the option, oh, did I leave friction on? That's not good. Friction takes a lot of computation. Yeah, friction itself, if you can turn it off, if you don't care about the frictional effects, like this ball is normally rolling. So friction's not gonna have a huge effect on its dynamics. Uh, if you're trying to model a bowling ball going down a bowling alley, that would friction matters then. Oh, let me zoom out. Okay. So just calculated the motion. It took a while at the beginning to set up basically all the geometry, all the things I had to calculate. So let's see how it how it works. Go back to the beginning, it goes fine, and oh crap, what happened? It fell straight through. Two parts. It's not two parts, it's the same part. It went straight through the solid body, it started moving pretty quick. Uh, so you see right there, it's actually violating the uh, solid body contact, and just went straight through. Skipped right through the solid. Anybody dare, anybody dare to uh, guess why that would happen? Sure. Unstoppable force, unmovable object. It calculates its location at every given time, and if it calculates its location, there's no object. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. In the interval between the time steps that actually checked. It passed completely through that wall. Uh, in one of them, it was kind of in the wall, but obviously, whatever check it's applying, uh, it passed. Uh, so SolidWorks thinks this is the correct type of physical dynamics. This shows you some of the error that can manifest itself whenever you deal with a discrete numeric simulation. It doesn't always have to follow reality. The way you fix this is by clicking on options. Uh, let's up the frames for a second, just because it makes it smoother anyway. You go down here to 3D contact resolution. This is basically exactly what the gentleman, what's your name? John. John. It's exactly what John was talking about. How detailed is the contact going to be? The higher you crank this number, the more computing you have to do. So that's why it starts kind of low. Let's run this again. In fact, I want to make sure I turn off uh, friction here. Nope. Off. Okay, that should save us some computer. Click process. Set everything up and solve for the motion. 
And this might work. It might not. I might I, I might have to update, up that slider some more. Uh, if it doesn't work, I'll just leave you guys to solve that. Or what's another option? Like that? If I didn't want to keep upping that slider, if I didn't want to take uh, more and more time to process this, what else could I do? Keep in mind that I designed that tube how I wanted. Make the part tube thicker. Yeah, just make it thicker so it's not it doesn't skip through quite as easily. That's definitely one way to solve it. Still working. Come on. What was the name of that slider again? It's a part contact detail, part contact fidelity. We're slowing that up. It might take uh, the problem state longer for what we're waiting on now. Solid body contact is this uh, cam and lifter button. That's what solid body contact is. This is gravity, solid body contact. This is a force button. This is a button specifically for damping if you want it without a spring. This is a button specifically for springs without damping. This is a motor button. Like, you remember that assembly you made with the handle on it? And you spin it manually? You could, put, you could easily place a motor on the axis that you normally spun, uh, make an animation, and just sit there and watch it, watch it spin. All right. Oh, there it goes. What happened? Did it work? Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Let's play from the beginning. The solid body contact didn't fix it. At this point, I'd recommend probably making that tube thicker uh, to make it less likely to skip right through. You could keep playing with settings here to make it more precise. Um, but all you're going to do, in fact, the accuracy settings is what I'd mess with next. All you're going to do uh, is um, take up more processing time. If you just want to make it go through the hoop, I'd make the pipe thinner. Just for reference, that's a quarter inch thick. So when you're making your own part, keep that in mind. Okay, you obviously there's no problem. Just take it that is solid, so maybe use that as a uh, guiding dimension. Anyway, so solve that problem. You make it go through a loop. You can do a little spiral helix going down, whatever you want. Obviously, you're gonna be using a lot of sweeps to make that problem work. So that is the lander for marble. Uh, finally, we're going to go down to, what was that, oh, I didn't need that button anyway. Before I lose it. How did you turn on the path tracing? Oh yeah, that's what I was going to show you guys. Thanks for reminding me. What's up about the Marvel Game Assembly? Uh, motion study, if you go to motion analysis, two best turn on. Uh, I'll just do contact, I guess. Then gravity, the y direction. Okay, solve this. It's just going to fall right off the end of the ramp. Okay. Um, it's kind of interesting. You can even see it, how it oscillates back and forth in that larger channel. Let's turn on the tracing. You can go to plot, so the category, you go to uh, displacement. Subcategory trace path. You simply collect, you can drag this slider all the way back to the beginning, which, where is the, uh, the ball is gone. Okay. Close, you drag this all the way back to the beginning, which is the ball will come back. Do that again. Displacement, trace path. I simply click on that point, say okay. And that traces its path in 3D. You can see it ended up way down there somewhere. Um, in the void. Yep. Parabolic motion. You actually also see how the path oscillates back and forth. It lands and uh, oscillates back and forth in the channel. So it really helps if you want to track like the 3D position of a uh, of a, a digger, like a mechanism. You've all seen this, the really complicated mechanical arms that they'll use in like caterpillar digger things or a really complicated 3D motion. Like maybe you're working on a robot to do pick and place on an assembly line. That's one way to track its motion. Do some really interesting stuff. Uh, any other questions? Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah. Uh, can you show the view of the, the plots one more time? Plots. <coughs> okay, so XY plot. Uh, if you wanted to do acceleration, we've got acceleration subcategory. I want to do uh, linear acceleration. I could do magnitude. It's the most common. And then again, I'll plot the acceleration of that guy. Say OK versus time. That's what, that's what his acceleration looks like. Uh, the big spike right there is probably right when it hits the, uh, the track. All right.
So that, I think, pretty much covers what you have to do for homework. But now it's something that I spent quite a bit of time on this weekend because I knew SolidWorks could do it, but I didn't want to do this live because we'd still be, we'd be sitting here for another hour and a half waiting for SolidWorks to solve it. Um, let me go to the other folder. You can tell by the sheer number of files in here that it's a simulation. It generated a lot of stuff. In fact, it generated 275 megabytes of just simulation data. Uh, first thing I want to show you is the glass and potato video. Uh, this is taking SOLIDWORKS' nonlinear uh, physics solver and combining it with FEA. So what's happening, we just did physics simulations, but everything in there is a rigid body, right? If it bounces off each other, it doesn't calculate stress, it doesn't flex, it's perfectly rigid, it just bounces off. So this is not a rigid body, this is steel hitting a glass plate. Uh, the glass obviously isn't going to fracture, SOLIDWORKS doesn't model that, but whenever you simulate it slow enough, like this is coming in I think at several meters per second, you actually see the pressure wave emanate out from that rock or whatever it might be through the glass. You can see the actual pressure, the stress is calculated through the panel, you kind of see things going out. You take a baseball bat, model that in SOLIDWORKS, like an aluminum bat, model the baseball coming in at a certain speed, impact it, you can see the pressure go out and down the bat, wrapping around it, the pressure wave would spin around in 3D, hit the ends, come back in, and that will let you discover where this, the sweet spot of everything is just by uh, simulating. That simulation will probably take most of an afternoon to solve, but uh, it's really kind of neat. You can solve stuff in this time scale, you see pressure waves going through things. That being said, uh, that was just a test. Um, ability. This is what I was really going after because that is a 2x4 hitting a storm shelter, pretty indicative of what you guys turned in as a class. It's a quarter inch steel plate. You can see as the 2x4 comes in, obviously it turns into this noodle shape. Why am I not worried about that being a noodle? It's probably going to shatter. It just shattered. It just exploded. And even though it's, it might tap up against it a couple other times, the main force happens right at impact. One thing that's really neat is when it hits, watch the pressure wave bounce back up the 2x4. It actually travels back out. So this is fully nonlinear. This is basically showing you SolidWorks' best estimation of the physics that's happening. But one thing you look at, it's kind of like, this isn't very smooth. It's just kind of noisy. It's, it looks like low resolution, pretty much. In fact, that's exactly what it is. It's a low resolution grid. I did a low res version first to make sure it's going to work. And then the high resolution gave me all sorts of trouble. I spent most of the afternoon trying to get it to work again. But this is the same thing in high resolution. See how the, uh, the force emanating out from the impact point is more spherical? It's more round than the previous. <coughs> also note that as the force comes out of the side panel, how much of it hits up top? Almost none. Why would that be? Serious? Guesses? Somebody make a guess. This will be fun. It, it, it took me a second to figure it out. To develop my theory, I think I'm right. Is it based off the edges? Is it because you have it assembled? So what? Because it looks like you have one thing butted up against another. Like, I don't know. And to fill you in, it's only two parts. This is it's actually a surface part and a solid body. That's another thing that's interesting. To do this as a solid, you have uh, nodes on the front and back. To simplify it, I did this as a thin surface. So it reduced the number of nodes and processing time substantially. Yeah. The uh, the strength of a board or something like that, if you hit it on the side, is going to be a lot stronger on the on the smallest surface area because it's you know if you think about it that way it's thicker. Yeah, so you, can, like you can think about that regard. There. Um, and that, that you're saying bending versus compression, basically. Uh, what's really happening, and that's that's kind of partly right. Uh, Whenever this oscillation happens, it happens in the direction of the impact, right? It's vibrating this way. Whenever you get up to this corner, you now have a lot of support in that direction. You're trying to put this total top surface into compression. And so it's almost acting like a rigid edge. It's almost like acting like something's just holding onto that edge. So you actually see as it hits the sides, what comes around the front is not anywhere as strong as what's actually on the side, right? It suffers going around that corner, suffers going around that corner. In fact, nothing gets to the top. In fact, if you look, these corners almost reflect the strength, the, the uh, impact back in. It really is acting just like waves in a pool. It's, I think it's very fascinating to see what's happening on this time scale. Uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty neat. Yeah, that's cool, right? Am I, not, am I just that big of a geek that, uh, 
Okay, it's cool. <laughs> right. Uh, you can I do this with bullets. Yeah. You can do this with an airplane. Like uh, you guys like to fly RC airplanes. Sometimes with UAVs, you have to make them sustain a certain impact to the ground. In fact, this would be an excellent uh, example of that. You could you could show the plane belly landing. You know, assuming it's a small one, and then show how the stress passes through the structure. You could show a plane, a normal plane, landing on a runway, and at its maximum condition, you know, like maximum descent rate, and show how the structure reacts. Like show the wings flexing down, show the stress passing through the landing gear, through the fuselage, out to the wings, the tail. And even though it would take a long time to solve, it would work. Let's see what other cool videos do I have? 70 KSI. This is a, I changed the scale uh, down to 70 KSI. This is mild steel, uh, maxes at like 69,900 PSI, which is 70 KSI. So anywhere that turns red is going to be beyond the yield point of the steel that the shelter is made of. Does that mean those areas are going to break? Um, Dead. Plastically, plastically deformed. They pass the yield strength. That means plastic deformation will happen. Obviously, this this board is just. I think it's hilarious how noodly it gets. <laughs> but uh, it'd be nice if SolidWorks could break the elements apart and show it shattering. But uh, I guess beggars can't be choosers, right? They did kind of give this to us for free. Um, so anyway, I made a strain movie after that 70 KSI. Uh, in fact, this is 1.5% strain. So 1.5 <coughs> times e to the negative 2. So that's 0 0.015 uh, strain, so 1.5%. Uh, steel will rupture, the point at which it comes completely apart, at, depending on which steel, up to 15% strain. So you can stretch steel quite a bit before it just goes. And you can see we're nowhere near that. So you'll end up with a lot of dents in your storm shelter. You'll probably end up with a deformed storm shelter. But showing this plot uh, really helps to substantiate the fact that uh, quarter-inch steel would probably get the job done against one 2 by 4 That's the other thing. Um, how many test cases would it take to prove that you're good against a whole tornado? A lot. Infinite. Thousands. Hundreds. You know, maybe you get down to like 80 or so. Too many. Uh, don't be that guy. Don't be the guy who tries to simulate your way out of doing actual engineering work. Uh, but still, this is really impressive. It goes a long way. And remind yourselves where you sat when you came into the class. Do you have any capability how to model stuff like this or what to click on to get this to happen? Remember I said, you know, simulate an impact on a storm shelter, 2 by 4 tornado debris, stuff like that. But now you have a tool. You know how to model things in. You know how to do physics simulation. You know how to do FEA. And if you go to nonlinear dynamics and read a few tutorials, this is quite simple to do with what you know now. So you can go throw electronic things and other electronic things and see how, see how it works. Um, the, the basis of this is a contact constraint. It, you have to click. It basically acts like normal FBA. It's an assembly. You go to nonlinear, then click on nonlinear non -linear dynamic. And then you have to make sure you set up the contact constraint between this uh, board and whatever else it is you want. Set their meshes to non-interfering, which means they're not allowed to, uh, you know, to interfere, to intermesh. Uh, they have to stay outside as physics would require. Um, and other than that, it's just a lot of processing time and trouble troubleshooting. One of the problems I had was that, again, because of the problem with the discrete time stepping, if the nose of this board actually skips all the way through the wall, in one time step, it doesn't know that the board is now like penetrating the, uh, the entire storm shelter. So you have to keep the time step very small. But that is pretty much one of the most substantial things SolidWorks can do, in my opinion. So hopefully you find that impressive. Uh, ask, answer any questions you have about it. Uh, you have questions? How long does that take to simulate? This is still a fairly low res version. Uh, to do something real, I would probably double or triple the node count. But this to simulate took uh, 30, 45 minutes. Um, obviously, it's still kind of a short video. Uh, to do something like you really want to for an engineering, <coughs> real engineering analysis, you'd probably simulate this overnight uh, with a higher mesh, with a higher grid. Um, so it'll take a while. More degrees of freedom, the longer it'll take. Goes roughly with the number of nodes squared. Any other questions? I'll see you guys in the lab. Thank you for attending.